Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the Skipper's Meeting for the 106th Chicago Yacht Club Race to Mackinac. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes to start with. Uh, this is a courtesy meeting. Um, the skipper person in charge is responsible to um, read the NOR, the SIs, the RRS, the max safety regs, and all those sorts of uh, information we've all come to know and read before. This year, sorry about this. Also want to remind you of the uh, multiple media um, opportunities uh, this year. Instagram, that's new this year, Facebook, Twitter, Flickr. So there's lots of opportunity to um, get all our fun and adventure out to uh, friends and family so that they know how exciting and dramatic all this racing up there can be. So again, um, sail fast, uh, sail safe, and have fun. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Commodore Bober. On behalf of the Chicago Yacht Club, uh, the flag and board of directors, and especially the uh, committee that puts together the race to Mackinac, welcome. Um, one of the things that I like to underscore is I hope you all have a lot of fun and you're safe. One of my jobs is to point out that we have sponsorship uh, that helps uh, keep our costs in check, and I'd like to remind you of who they are. Bob Clico is a co-sponsor of the race, Mount Gay Rum, Gill uh, is the official logo apparel provider, Michigan Avenue Magazine is uh, going to have its event at Navy Pier, the uh, shore thing, and then of course Crowley's Yacht Yard and West Marine. Uh, we're very thankful to them. But the point I want to really make is I hope you have fun and stay safe. Cheers. Thank you, Commodore Rover. Uh, now I'd like to introduce um, our MAC chairman for this year, and that's Matt Gallagher. Morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for being here, and um, I'm happy to be here. I think I'm the first person in the cruising division to chair the race, so uh, it's kind of fun. Plus, I so I get to race with all you guys today, and uh, I should point out also Commodore Bober will be on uh, Infinite Diversion, so he'll be out there this morning also. So happy to have him. Um, so thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks for being part of our race. I mean, this is this is what we do every summer, and it's it's cool to get to do it with all you guys. Um, first of all, I want to introduce, uh, you know, we, this is a year-round effort, and um, I've got lots and lots and lots of people who help, help put this thing together every year, and I, I get to stand up here, but it's the work of 25 people year-round, volunteer members of this club, and then we surge around this time of year to probably, uh, probably 50. Um, so first of all, anyone who's in the MAC committee, if you guys don't mind standing up, and I uh, hope everyone will thank them for, for uh, participating. And in, uh, in particular, I want to thank my vice chairman. Uh, there's about, there are uh, six of us, six vice chairs plus me who, who probably put in a little bit extra time, and I, I definitely want to take a moment to thank him. So first of all, our PRO, Janet Crabb, who you all hear from later on, is also vice chair of the race. Jim Murray, who gets to take over from me when I go off sailing this afternoon, which is nice. Jay Muller, you've all heard from before. And then we also have, who are not here, Jason Veach, Sarah Renz, and David Hughes, who's up on the island already getting things ready for all of us up there. So thanks to all you guys for all the help. Um, and uh, just a word on behalf of um, our friends over at Bayview. Commodore Tim Proffitt from Bayview wanted to be here. He couldn't quite get here in time. But um, next year is the 100th anniversary of their club. They run the other Mac race, the small Mac race. But uh, nonetheless, we love them. It's a fantastic race. And uh, Tim wanted me to extend an invitation to all of you to come over and do their race next year. He's going to be here for the afternoon skippers meeting. So if you're a racer who's going to come back, you'll hear a few words from Tim. But they put on a fantastic product. It's a different race than ours. Um, it's a fun race. And so I encourage you all to think about it next year. Um, next, I'd like to invite a, another Detroit guy up, Dr. Tom Kopp. Um, 
is a sailor uh, over from that part of the state, but uh, he's also a physician and is doing a medical study that we agreed to participate in along with Bayview. And so I wanted to give Tom a couple words to talk about that, a couple minutes to talk about that. Thanks. Good morning. As mentioned, my name is Thomas Kopp. I'm one of the uh, emergency medicine resident physicians um, at St. Vincent's in Toledo. I'd like to thank uh, Ray Sherman Gallagher as well as Jay Muller for allowing me to speak to you this morning regarding a medical research study that we're conducting. Um, for those that have done the Newport to Bermuda race, this might um, be familiar to you. And certainly we've also included um, the last two years of the Port Huron race. So this is the first year that we're conducting the research on the Chicago race and we're very excited about doing that. So one thing is, uh, why is this important to you? Um, essentially we're, um, in the back of the room there's some, these green sheets that um, are survey um, we're asking everybody to fill um, one of these out, one per boat, um, and then identify any injuries and illnesses uh, that take place. Um, from my standpoint, I'd like to find out if there's any differences in injury and illness patterns between ocean racing and Great Lakes racing. But I think from the utility um, of the study, um, it will also help uh, future racers prepare for the event um, and get an idea of what to expect. Now. Secondly, what can you do? Like I mentioned, um, we ask that you fill out the survey. Surveys are not in the, in the uh, race packet, but they're in the back of the room. We'll also have volunteers, including myself, on the island um, collecting uh, the surveys once you finish. Um, when you go to turn in your transponder and finishing card, uh, we'll be there to facilitate completion of the, um, the survey as well. Things that we're interested in, in um, Collecting any reason that you would use a medical kit um, would be valid. So um, any cuts, um, bruises, burns, for example, any illnesses, including seasickness. Um, but we're focusing on what happens during racing hours. So falling off the bar stool at the Pink Pony doesn't count. Being mauled by a horse on the island doesn't count. But um, anything that happens during the race, anything that takes your focus off of racing and having to address a, a medical issue would be valid to include. So um, I'll be available afterwards to address any questions in the back of the room. Um, other than that, um, sail uh, fast, sail safe, and turn in your surveys. Thank you. I know from Tom's point of view, he'd like to gather data, but I'm personally hoping you don't have anything to fill in on those forms when you get up there. Um, I'm sorry, I, I missed one vice chairman because I was assuming he was off racing. John Zienda, who's standing over here, sitting over here in the front row, uh, was responsible for the Safety Thursday series this year, um, which hopefully you guys are all getting. Um, I hope you read them. Um, those get circulated all over the place. We've received a lot of national attention um, for those in, in race management fields. And so thank you, John, for taking care of that. Um, all right, a couple housekeeping matters. Um, you all, all the skippers here got uh, what I refer to as my crew behaving badly email um, a couple couple days ago or so. Um, I just want to reemphasize, you guys as the invited competitors of these boats are personally responsible for the behavior of your crew from the time they get here until the time they leave the island. Um, it's, we have 3,500 competitors, great racers of various types. 3,495 of them are going to behave extremely well, have a great time in the island. That's what we want you to do. That's what the folks in the island want you to do. But unfortunately, every year, there are two or three or four or five people who maybe, as I tell my six-year-old, has bad behavior. Um, and um, as a reminder, you're responsible for that. That's spelled out in the NOR. And uh, the consequence of that almost certainly will be uh, not being invited back to race in this race in the future. So please have a talk with your crew. Make sure they have a great time on the island, but that they behave themselves like gentlemen and ladies. And remember, we're guests there. It's a small island. Um, anything that happens, we hear about it. And so please make sure your crew behaves themselves. Thanks. Um, transponders, everyone's getting a yellow brick unit. It's exactly the same as last year. Um, please be careful with those. That's going to cost you. You may not remember, but you checked a box. If that doesn't get turned in, um, it's going to cost you a fairly decent amount of money. Um, if you lose that thing. Um, so make sure it gets turned in in the island. Um, we're going to hear some wonderful news from Chris about the wind here in a little bit. Um, but if you don't make it to the island, which does happen occasionally, um, 
you still got to get the transponder back. There's information in the NOR on how to do that. Um, you can also uh, uh, email our race coordinator if you wind up sitting in Ludington or Pentwater or something like that because you can't make it up there. Um, but please don't lose those things. Um, uh, one other d uh, housekeeping matter, and then I'm going to turn this over. Um, docking, we have had, a, I, I don't really understand why, but we have had a significantly higher percentage of people asked to be on the island this year. Normally, every year we get some people want to be in Ignis, some people want to be in Straits for whatever reason. But percentage-wise, there's a bigger chunk of the fleet that wants to be on the island this year than we've seen in the last couple of years. Um, Janet Baxter is a member of this club um, and is managing docking. She's doing a fantastic job to get as many boats on the island as we possibly can. We're blessed that water levels are up about 14 inches from where they were last year. That's good news. If anyone was here two years ago, you remember the joy we had when they were down about two feet from where we are. So we got a lot of water, but we got a lot of boats too. We, we need your cooperation and patience. You've been pre-assigned a docking zone. That doesn't mean you're going to be in that docking zone. You need to cooperate with the people on the radio when you get up there. The docking zone assumes that people get there in the order that we guess that they're going to get there based on past performance, but you know, obviously none of us know. Um, new this year, um, Janet and Jay Kehoe, around the water director, came up with this idea. This is the what do I do when I get to the island envelope or when I get to the bridge envelope. In this envelope is what you need to finish the race amongst all the other squalor in your skipper's bag. Um, it includes a little note from Janet, which I would encourage you to read on the process for docking, your finish cards, which you also need, and I thought it was, I don't have one in here, but the zone map of, of where the zones are. Um, on the front of this, after you're tired and fly eaten and haven't slept for a couple days, um, is a cheat sheet. It refers to the sections of the SIs and everything. That, that's what governs. But this tells you who you need to talk to on the radio at what point. Um, and and how to get how to get to your dock and then and then get to the pink pony from there. So uh, we appreciate everyone's cooperation. It's rare that we have a problem with that, but please do what they tell you, not what they what you think they're going to tell you, not what they told you up here, but what they told you when you get there. Um, listen to them on the radio. We've got some really fantastic volunteers and staff working um, that operation, but we're going to need everyone's cooperation. So thanks. Um, and next, um, I'd like to introduce our chief judge, Fred Hagedorn, who is going to um, talk to you for a couple of minutes. Um, our jury this year consists of Fred Hagedorn and um, Fred Horowitz from Milwaukee and Andrea Krasinski, another uh, Chicago Yacht Club member. And our jury secretary, Sam Vayu, is here somewhere. Sam, raise your hand. There's our jury secretary, Sam Vayu. All right, Fred. Good morning. Uh, I want to wish you all the very best sailing. Uh, we do something. We did something unusual this year. We don't. We try not to have changes to the sailing instructions, but we did have one, and I wanted to explain it to you briefly so you can understand that it's not a big change, but it's something that should make things actually better for competitors. Um, we changed. Right now, the way the sailing instructions were written originally, uh, you can do an alternative penalty during the first six hours of the race. After that, that went away and there was no alternative penalty. So if in fact you were in a protest situation and you thought that you had broken the rule, if you're a Corinthian sailor, you might come to the conclusion that you needed to withdraw from the race. That's not our hope. We want, you're sailing a 333 mile race. We want you to sail the race, have a good time and feel good about it. So we've given you the opportunity that if you think you've done something wrong, you can raise your hand at the end of the race submit a protest form saying, I think I may have broken a rule. And then the protest committee can help you figure that out. And the protest committee has the ability to do any level of, of, pro, of uh, judgment. So we could take a minute off of you or two hours, or we could disqualify you depending on how serious it is. But at least it's not being forced to withdraw from the race. So we've tried to make this a friendlier race for the sailors. We hope that, that um, it takes a little bit of stress off of you if you find yourselves in the middle of a difficult decision. Put it off till the end of the race. All right, thank you and have a great sail. All right, thank you, Fred, um, and thanks to our jury. I'm hoping uh, none of you see them anywhere other than at the Pink Pony on Wednesday. So that's, that's, our, that's, our, that's all of our goal. Um, all right, next I would like to introduce our vi race vice chairman, but more importantly today, our principal race officer, Janet Crabb.
Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, on behalf of the Chicago Yacht Club Race Committee and all the volunteers, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for racing our race. We enjoy having you here and we enjoy participating in the race with you. Um, the first thing I'd like to do is uh, introduce my volunteers that have helped me so much over the past year putting this race together and many faces that you've seen so far um, since you've been here. Uh, Jane McMillan is my, please stand up. Jane McMillan is my APRO, DRO, whatever you call it. I have uh, Brian Harbo who came in. He's a regional race officer from Texas. And I think you all know Hella Getz from our race committee. She's also been registration upstairs. And then this wouldn't be a race without our own race committee chairman, uh, Janet Baxter. So she has also been a big part of this and she's head of docking as has been said before. Um, one of the things I want to go over with you is some of the in-house changes we've made in the sailing instructions in the last 12 months that you won't see as, uh, you know, changes upstairs, just so you, you're familiar with them. Um, the first thing that you'll see is that we have changed everything from the uh, race committee tent to the race committee headquarters. We found that in case of rain, we do move into the Windermere Hotel. For some reason, other um, electricity and water and race committee just don't mix very well, so I want to keep them safe. Um, Call-ins, should you be out there on um, Wednesday morning? Um, the, the SIs, and I'm going to have to read this just to make sure, SIs between 1 and, that is 001, and 0200 on Wednesday morning, you have to call in. We've also added the uh, ability to text those messages in and let us know where you are. It, it, it's going to take a really sober person because it, it asks for the, uh, the lat lawns also on the text. So <laughs> you may want to try that phone call first. Um, sailboards. We have really kind of stepped up our, our stuff with sailboards. It really, it keeps us able to score you properly. We keep teasing about going to the pink pony, but when you hold up your sailboard like this and there's eight digits involved or something, it's really hard for us to read it. Uh, we just want you to make sure that you've got that up there and in that note we have asked you to put it up 0.5 nautical miles before the finish and keep it up until your finish has been confirmed by the race committee. As you know you have to call in, confirm your finish. When we acknowledge it, that's when you can take it down. So we just want to make sure we have everyone's numbers right. Um, official notice board has moved been moved to online. So now you can, do, you can um, check the notice board even while you're out on the water. You can get to that notice board um, either by, by our website um, or you can go to Chicago Yacht Club, find Race to Mackinac and go that way. But it's under Race Documents or there is a button at the lower, uh, 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 lower portion on the left side that you can go directly to official notice board. Two ways to get there. Um, okay, uh, one quick reminder to save yourself five minutes on each of these penalties because we have automatic penalties that allow us to unfortunately penalize you if you don't do things right. We don't like to do that. And by the way, in the past few years, we have never had to do this. So I hope this is another year of that. Um, 14.4, bridge call-in and acknowledgement. Please get an acknowledgement. And if you can't get through and you're hearing other people get through, ask another boat to relay. And that's fine. We just want to know you're out there. Um, be compliant on the sailboards. Your finished call-in and acknowledgement. Turn in your finished card, and that is three hours after you finish, not after you dock. Luckily, everybody's been able to understand that too. And then of course we have the touch and go. So please um, listen to the docking people at touch and go and, and make sure that you're compliant with that. Uh, the score has asked me to tell you that the ORR mix will be mainly downwind for your race and we will be posting that out on the water also. So mainly downwind is how you will be scored. And um, the only other thing I ask is if you're in section one, 
and you're out here to check in, could you do that before the, like 2.45 or 2.50 so that you give room for the starters in the first start to, to you know, get in the process there? So with that, I think I'm done. How many of you plan to go to the Grand Hotel uh, cocktail party on Sunday afternoon? Raise your hand. Okay. Good, we'd love to see you, but just remember there is a dress code. Bring your, bring your blazers. So, thanks so much. All right, thanks everybody. Thank you, Janet. Um, one, uh, <laughs> I'm not worried about making it to the, to the porch party. I'm leaving my blazer at home. Um, one other person I should have introduced who's not here is our Chief Inspector, Lisa Gaston. Some of you have had the pleasure of meeting her, I'm sure, already. Some of you will have the pleasure of meeting her when you get up to the island, um, if you're selected for inspection. Despite the conspiracy theories, those are truly random. Um, they are random inspections there to make sure that, that you got up there safely with all the safety equipment you had on the boat. We ask for your cooperation. Um, they know you're tired, they know you're hot and sweaty and really just want to get off that boat, but they have a very important job to do to make sure that, that we're all safe out there. So please cooperate with them if you are um, lucky enough to get picked to be inspected. Um, and last of all, the guy you're actually here to hear, probably, not from me, um, I want to introduce Chris Bedford, um, our meteorologist for the race for a good number of years. Um, he's absolutely one of the best in the business. We are, we're very privileged to have Chris uh, doing this presentation, and he's going to let you know what, uh, mainly about, about 20 out of the southeast, Chris, something like that? Something like that. Something like that. Good morning, everyone. It's great to be back here again, and it's even better knowing that I'll be taking a plane out of here tomorrow and not a boat. Um, but seriously, I think it's going to be a decent race, and in fact, for, the, uh, for, for your division, I think it looks a little bit better than it does for the, the racing, racing division. I think you get a little bit of a, a boost today that they, they will miss. Um, since we've sat down here, something important has happened with the weather. Can anyone tell me what it is? Excellent. All right. I am very proud of you. The wind has shifted to the southeast. Uh, we have a lake breeze that has arrived. Uh, when we first got here, it's still out there. There's a line of uh, cumulus, convergence cumulus, just uh, offshore. So that was uh, developed by a southeast uh, wind offshore and a southwesterly wind in here on inshore this morning. Uh, planes landing to the southwest at Midway. Who needs weather models? Use your eyes. Always maintain situational awareness at all times and uh, pick up little clues like that and uh, it'll help you along the way. So anyway, we've got this convergence line now. It's starting to break up a little bit. The southeasterly actually builds in underneath that. It's a shallow lake breeze initially and will deepen over time and that'll erode that cloud line. And what we'll see is we'll see clear sinking air over the lake uh, later this morning and this afternoon and we'll have some cumulus development uh, on shore indicating the thermals supporting, supporting the lake breeze. So all that, that's all you need to know to, know, to understand what is going to be happening with the weather at least this afternoon. You don't need uh, any kind of weather model or anything, anything like that. You don't need me for that matter. All right. So um, always have my disclaimer up here that uh, you should, uh, despite what I say, I'm, I'm here just for guidance and, and uh, uh, imaginary things that might or may not happen in the future. But uh, you should always uh, maintain vigilance, uh, as I said, not only with your eyes, but when you can uh, pick up the NOAA weather radio on your VHF, you should check in with that periodically. Obviously, you don't want to leave that voice droning all day long, um, but have a schedule of just checking in and getting the observations and the latest forecasts. And if anything um, you know, unexpected might be happening in the periphery around you, and then, of course, if things don't look right, you want to pick up your vigilance. Or if weather looks threatening, you want to keep, then you might want to keep that radio on to see if there's any warnings or uh, advisories being issued uh, for you. So you definitely want to make sure that you're uh, keeping an awareness at all times of the weather and what's going on. 
be proactive. If, thing, if something doesn't look right, it probably isn't right, and you should uh, take some sort of action. Um, safety first, racing second. All right, so we're going to go through the uh, thunderstorm outlook, always an issue around uh, the Great Lakes um, this time of year. And as we've seen in past races, it plays a, can play a, a very uh, big role. Uh, this year, we're, we're looking pretty good for uh, thunderstorms in the, in the sense that uh, we're going to have some uh, dry weather over us, I think, for most of the race and good conditions. We're not expecting any, any thunderstorms uh, today, tomorrow, or even into, um, even into Sunday. Um, there may be some leaking into the western Great Lakes on um, uh, Sunday and into Monday. Right now, it doesn't look like there'll be anything significant. Uh, but again, that's, this is one of the situations where as we get further uh, away in time, of course, the reliability and the accuracy of weather forecasting decreases. Um, and so, you, you know, that's the, we're basically just signaling here that something may change toward the end of the forecast. So you may want to uh, check in with the forecast and make sure uh, nothing is threatening uh, seriously. Uh, as you get further up the lake. Uh, but right now, it doesn't look like we'll have anything uh, significant bothering us. All right, so here's our uh, surface analysis for today. And uh, we're looking at that big uh, high pressure sitting over the eastern United States. And it extends a ridge, which is basically an elongation uh, of the high pressure area out west across the Great Lakes and into, into Wisconsin. This high uh, doesn't really move a whole lot. It just kind of slowly uh, pushes out to, the, out to the east. And we maintain at least um, a shadow of that ridge across the lakes right into uh, Sunday. Uh, and then eventually, we're going to be looking at that low pressure that you see up uh, north of uh, Montana in uh, southern Canada. Uh, right now, it looks like that low is going to move very, very slowly to the east and uh, may actually move around the uh, northern side of the Great Lakes and not uh, press down into, into the area. But we look at the isobars to get an idea of what the wind is going to uh, be, or what the wind is, based upon the pressure field. And as we look at this diagram here, we can see the isobars are very far apart uh, the, um, around the high pressure area. So we have weak gradient wind. For those of you that don't know what a gradient wind is, you hear that term, just think of it as the weather map wind. It's the wind that is defined by the weather map. And um, so in the case of um, high pressure, a gradient wind is a circulation that is clockwise. In the case of low pressure, it's a circulation that is counterclockwise. And then as those isobars get closer together on the weather map, then the wind increases. So you'll notice that the isobars are closer together across Minnesota and the Dakotas. And um, if that area of low pressure moves closer to us, then those, iso those packed isobars will start to move toward the Great Lakes as well. And then we'll start to see the wind increase. Right now, it looks like, as we'll look through the uh, forecast uh, prognostic charts here in a second, um, it looks like the ridge holds across most of the Great Lakes, but especially kind of the southern half of Lake Michigan. So it kind of protects us from that low pressure area and anything coming in from the west and northwest. The northern part of the lake, however, does start to see some of that pressure gradient increase across, uh, to the south east of that low center. And so the northern part of the lake will probably see a bit stronger wind uh, coming in um, and, and, and kind of sustain that breeze. So better breeze, generally speaking, through the weekend over the northern half of the lake, lighter breeze uh, over the southern half of the lake. Get the next slide, there we go. OK, got to put up a satellite image. I mentioned the uh, cumulus out here. Those will be coming and going through the day. We do have a storm system down over the southern US. And we're j if you look to the south, you can just see high in the sky, actually even a few fragments overhead. You can just see some high cirrus clouds. Don't worry about those. Those should be uh, shunting out to the, uh, to the east 
And uh, even if they're overhead, they're thin enough, they're not going to um, uh, affect our weather. All that uh, cluster of uh, cloud that you see down across the Ohio Valley is going to be kind of moving up toward and extending up toward the northeast, but right now it looks like it stays all to the southeast uh, of the lake. And so, uh, again, on the radar, there's nothing really around us. There's some ground clutter indicated over northern Illinois. Ignore that. The main rain area is down in the central Mississippi and Tennessee Valley area. And again, that looks like it'll, it will ooze up into the Ohio Valley and up into Ohio uh, over the next couple of days, but uh, the area should stay to the south, uh, south of us. Uh, winds across the lake this morning, you can see generally sort of a southerly flow, a light southerly flow, kind of five knots uh, across most of the lake. But if you look up in the northern part of the lake, you'll see what I was talking about is a little bit more pressure up there because there's a little bit more gradient. Uh, the high pressure ridge over the southern part of the lake uh, keeps the, uh, uh, the winds lighter down across this area here. So this is before we have the lake breeze uh, started due to the, due to the heating. So this is the overnight wind. And obviously with the light uh, winds, we have uh, very little seaway out there at the moment. Hopefully that'll continue. And then I want to talk a little bit about water temperatures. We have very cold water temperatures this year. And uh, that'll, that'll play a couple roles. First of all, remember it's a safety issue if you ever do find yourself uh, having to go into the water. It is very cold, um, and uh, you want to be aware of that. Uh, there's also the weather uh, role that this, that this plays. Because we have such cold water temperatures this year, it will, it'll play a role in how strong the lake breeze is or how strong the overnight land breeze uh, effects are on the lake. So, of course, during the day when the land is warmer than the uh, air over the water, uh, we have a tendency for the air to flow onshore. And then at night, when the, the land cools, normally, if the lake is warmer, uh, we get a stronger, we get a, sorry, we get a, a land breeze that develops uh, flowing off the shore toward the lake. This year, because we have the colder uh, water temperatures, that's actually a positive for the lake breeze and a negative for the land breeze. So lake breezes should be a little bit stronger this year, uh, or lake breeze effects should be a little bit more stronger and, and more pronounced. And land breeze effects, that is the overnight wind from the drainage off the shore, will be weaker this year. So those years that you've relied on the overnight breeze along the shore, it will still be there, but it probably won't be as strong um, or as reliable as, as, as you've seen in previous years. Uh, the lake average temperature right now across the whole lake is about 60 degrees, which is quite chilly. Um, and the other factor here is that um, because of the cold water, that high pressure ridge is going to be more persistent. High pressure and cold are two things that go together very well. When you have uh, a cold um, water surface, the high tends to settle in and stick in the, over that colder water, and that will happen this year. And in particular, over the southern third of the lake, where we have that uh, uh, patch of cool water, uh, sort of that donut hole of colder water in the southern part of the lake, I think is going to be a location where the high pressure is going to stick. And so where that colder water is and where there's high pressure, you're going to have very light to no wind uh, in a weak gradient scenario, which is what we have. So I think generally speaking, particularly over that southern third of the lake and, and near that donut hole I mentioned um, in the center uh, of the lake, is you pretty much want to avoid that area as much as possible due to uh, the winds being very light. That will be where the lake breeze originates from, and then it, it, it's, so it's sinking air right in the middle of that cold uh, spot, and then the, the flow will be onshore, sort of on either side of it, into the Michigan shore, and of course here into the uh, Illinois shore. This is the forecast for this afternoon. And uh, we see that high pressure sitting out over the eastern United States and ridging across back, as I mentioned. And you'll notice I've dropped a high in just over the southern part of the lake to indicate what I was just talking about. Um, and you'll see that 
reappear over a couple of uh, the coming maps. And then we have that uh, low pressure area up over southern Canada. And you can see the tighter pressure gradient uh, developing across uh, sort of uh, northern, from northern Wisconsin back to the northwest. And that's where there's going to be uh, stronger gradient type winds. Um, but mainly over Lake Michigan, all we're going to have to be really driving the winds uh, are lake breezes. So uh, the, the shoreline is generally going to be favored in the daytime. Looking at the wind forecast, um, this is uh, for 1 o'clock this afternoon. You can see the lake breezes uh, pronounced along the Illinois-Wisconsin shore. And then where I dropped that, that high pressure in, on the weather map, you can see lighter winds along the Michigan shore. There's a general flow from the southeast over the southern part of the lake, uh, from the south uh, in the center and upper part of the lake, and then veering around to the southwest uh, up toward uh, Mackinac. And that's kind of the circulation around the broader high pressure area. But, but the lake breeze is kicking that breeze more onshore along the Illinois and uh, 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 Wisconsin shore, and also giving a little bit of a boost in the uh, wind speed there as well. For this evening, uh, again, you can see that light patch over the, uh, or off the Michigan shore. That's where that high is going to be sitting. And you can see the lake breeze is still persisting uh, at 7 o'clock tonight along the Illinois and Wisconsin shore, but it is starting to weaken. We're past the maximum heating for the day. And so we're going to be losing the thermal that's pulling that wind in off the lake and, and driving the lake breeze. So that breeze will gradually be subsiding, but still should be blowing a little bit along the uh, Illinois and uh, uh, Wisconsin shore. Going into the overnight period, which is, oh, look at this first. So this is the uh, surface chart for tonight. And you can see that the high is shifted out a little bit to the east. Uh, we still have a ridge, though, that's extending across Michigan and into northern Illinois. And the uh, low pressure, the main low, has moved north uh, uh, east from central Canada up toward James Bay, with a cold front now extending to the Minnesota-North Dakota border, and a second low starting to form down over South Dakota. So still light, weak gradient conditions over the southern half of the lake but a little bit of an increase of gradient flow across the northern part of the lake. And so these are the winds for the overnight period. And we see that the southern half, basically, of the lake has gotten a lot lighter. You'll notice that the wind speeds along the Wisconsin and Illinois shore have eased considerably. And also the wind has uh, veered around to a more southerly direction. And it's still very light in on the Michigan shore. But in the center of the lake, and particularly up, uh, say, north of Milwaukee, from mil about Milwaukee north, uh, you can see that gradient flow, that little bit of southerly uh, that is, is being supported by the uh, uh, lower pressure out to the northwest starting to fill up. But it is going to be a slow overnight period, big surprise. And, um, uh, but the further up the lake you go, the more chance you have of, of working your way into that uh, gradient breeze. So for 7 o'clock on Saturday morning, you can see the southern part of the lake has basically lost most of, the, most of its breeze, pretty much no land breeze. It's too early for the lake breeze. There's no gradient, so there's nothing really driving the wind in the southern part of the lake. But we still have a little bit of gradient flow moving from a, about halfway up the lake uh, toward the north. So we still have a, a, some modest southerly breeze. So it's a rich getting richer scenario. The further north you are, the more pressure you should be moving into uh, as you go. And then the Saturday's uh, weather map still shows the high pressure out to the uh, east with a ridge across uh, Huron down southern Lake Michigan, northern Illinois. That hasn't really changed a whole lot. Uh, the one difference is you'll see a trough of low pressure that is uh, pushing up, and that's that area of rain and cloud I was mentioning earlier on. That all appears like it's going to move out to the northeast and not really develop a whole lot. Um, so it shouldn't, shouldn't really be a bother to us, but we're going to be looking at sort of this finer scale uh, weather map with the high pressure, again, centered over the southern part of the lake and keeping winds, um, gradients light there. 
We do have the front, which has made some progress into Minnesota, but you'll see I've drawn it as a stationary front now, so it's kind of stalling across that area. Right now, there doesn't appear to be any threat of that front making significant progress to the southeast. It looks like it stays out in that area. There still is a little bit of gradient that's making its way into the northern part of the lake, and that's, that's good news. Uh, we hope that that happens. If for some reason the front stalls a little bit further to the northwest, then the ridge may actually resettle a little bit further north and keep winds lighter in the lake. That's kind of the doomsday scenario right now. Um, but at the moment, it looks like we maintain enough pressure so that once you get up um, into about halfway up the lake, you're able to get into that flow and just kind of carry it to the north. So here's the uh, weather map. And actually, this is a perfect example of almost a pure lake breeze over the southern part of the lake. Um, computer models are very good at predicting perfect examples of things. And then when you get out there, they're nothing like that. But hopefully, this will be pretty close. We have the, the, you can see the circulation of air spinning out of the high pressure area over the southern part of the lake. Weak lake breezes on both the Michigan and the uh, Illinois, Wisconsin shore. Um, in this image, it might look like there's, if, if you were starting at this time, uh, if you were the racer start, you might have a path that if you were brave enough to point the boat directly toward the Michigan shore out of the start, uh, get around upwind sort of around the, uh, the high pressure and keep some pressure up the Michigan shore. But I think the best play is to stay along the Illinois, Wisconsin shore. For you all, hopefully you'll be up in the, part of the middle part of the lake by this time and, and getting into more and more of that gradient flow, which is assisted by lake breeze in on the Wisconsin uh, shore that extends out to the, uh, the middle part of the lake. You'll notice that the winds are lighter on the Michigan shore, so it's favoring sort of the middle uh, of the lake at this point. Next slide. Thank you. And then by the evening, you can see the, uh, the lake breeze uh, circulation still well established. Nice pressure over on the Michigan shore and a weaker lake breeze up the Illinois, Wisconsin shore. Um, you'll also notice that the lake breeze is uh, pretty weak along the Michigan side. And so better pressure out in the center of the lake, uh, the further north you go. And then there's kind of a, a rather dismal looking area up uh, north of the Manitou's. Um, and that's sort of a convergence between lake breeze uh, and gradient on the Huron side and lake breeze on the Michigan side, sort of converging and leaving a zone of no wind up there. That's a common problem. Uh, Sunday, same, same basic weather map. Honestly, I did change these. These are, I did redraw these every time. Um, and uh, he's got to do something at 3 in the morning, so that's what I do. Um, we have the high pressure, we still have that trough out there, you can see that's moving away to the east and there's, I've still plopped a high pressure in over southern Lake Michigan. Our stationary front's still there, but uh, so the basic pattern really isn't changing a whole lot. And uh, for Sunday morning you can see the effects of the uh, weakening lake breeze due to the overnight cooling, not a whole lot of land breeze effect, but still a little bit of gradient blowing up over the uh, northern part of the lake promising thing the further north you go. For Sunday uh, morning, that picture hasn't changed a whole lot. Very light over the southern half of the lake. Still southerly pressure over the northern part of the lake. But that, that calm zone just sort of uh, north east of the Manitou's from Gra and from Gray's Reef basically over to Mackinac is, is holding. So um, it looks quite, quite light up there at this time. Sunday, now we're starting to see some changes. I got a little more creative with the weather map here. I must have had a cup of coffee by this time. So we've got the uh, high now moving a little bit east, actually moving over Michigan. And uh, we've got an active frontal boundary now that has moved into uh, um, uh, northern Lake Superior. So that, that stationary front has essentially become activated across northern Canada and is moving east. It looks like it's going to move north of the lake and uh, we're going to be waiting for the next front to come. Uh, but the high pressure is still holding, holding strong. And uh, then we've got uh, sort of a similar 
situation for Sunday afternoon. Doesn't look like it's changed a whole lot from Saturday. There's some minor differences. But again, I'm pointing out the uh, light area up over um, uh, between um, uh, the Manitou's basically over to Mackinac where the wind may be very light. And then Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, you can see the Michigan side is quite light, better pressure middle and western side of the lake. Next one, there we go. And then uh, Monday, we still have that stationary front holding out to the uh, uh, west of us and the cold front to the uh, east. High pressure now is starting to move out to the east, which is a good sign. It's hopeful that we'll start to see more and more of that gradient moving into the lake and trying to uh, boost the winds a little bit uh, for the finish. Uh, Monday morning, now we're starting to see more gradient flow uh, across the lake. So we're seeing more southerly winds all the way from the uh, southern part of the lake uh, up to the north. And uh, so that's with that high now moving out to the east, getting off the lake, we're able to get some flow around the back side of it and pulling all the way up to the lake. Still better pressure in the northern portion of the lake, except uh, up just to the west of Mackinac. Now we've got on Monday, we start to see a frontal boundary, a new frontal boundary coming in from the northwest. That old stationary front basically washes out as the high moves out to the east and we get a new low pressure area uh, developing out over the central plains. And uh, there may actually be some showers just starting to work their way across Superior uh, into the UP of Michigan uh, during the day on Monday and perhaps even into the lake. Here's the um, uh, wind forecast, you can see much better gradient flow now uh, supporting southerly breeze across the lake. We still have the light spot up toward Mackinac, but it is starting to fill in a little bit now as we get this, this gradient flow. Uh, by Tuesday night, uh, the front starts to work its way down finally, and we get stronger gradient flow uh, building across the lake. Uh, so more southwest winds. So as we get into Monday, later Monday and Tuesday, the winds just increase gradually uh, from the south and southwest across the upper part of the lake. So um, finishes should be coming fast and furious by that time. And then on Tuesday, we basically have southerly flow uh, coming up and um, uh, broad sort of 15 knots across much of the lake. Still lighter up across Mackinac basically because the wind has got more south than west in it, but at least there is some flow up there. So I just did a range of routes here. Um, uh, I wouldn't plan that you're actually going to sail any of these, but uh, these are, this is generally what the forecast is showing. And uh, so uh, we're basically looking for a starboard um, reach off the start that should open up a little bit into, into um, uh, uh, broad reach or run. Uh, and so you're initially staying fairly close to the Illinois-Wisconsin shore. Again, this is for, the, for starts today. Um, and uh, staying in that lake breeze. And then as evening comes, trying to get uh, offshore away from where the wind will be dying along the, the Wisconsin shore tonight. And then just playing the middle, middle part of the lake. You want to stay, uh, this year it looks like you want to stay off the Michigan shore and more toward the middle of the lake, a little bit different from a lot of other years. And then uh, uh, heading up into the stronger breeze uh, into the northern part of the lake. So uh, as I say there, you want to avoid getting too close to the uh, Michigan shore because there should be better gradient pressure uh, out in the center. And then just mentioning that initially winds are quite light up across Mackinac. Um, it does take some time really into later Monday, Tuesday for things to start to freshen up in that area to get, get to faster finishes uh, later in the race. That's it. Easy. Thanks very much. Good luck. Be safe. Yeah, Chris, we actually paid you to do a forecast for the whole race, so when you get a chance Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday also, it'd be nice. So. Um, all right, that's it, everyone. Thank you for coming. Have a fast race, I hope. Sail fast, and I'll see you on the island. Thank you. <laughs>